Okay, good morning, every or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us and welcome to today's webinar. This is the first of the Ask Arb series that we're running, so we look forward to your feedback at the end. Um, please let me know. Please let us know how you think it went, and whether you think it's valuable. Um, the aim of this series is to provide attendees with the opportunity to ask professionals everything they want to know on a particular topic. So today's topic is on speed limits and speed management. So. My name is Kate Pratt and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I'm an engineer in our safe systems team here in the Victorian office. I've been at ARB for about two and a half years. Um, recently, I've worked on some speed related projects for Mornington Peninsula Shire, um, looking at the effects of changes in speed limit in local and rural areas. And also some projects for Vic Roads, looking at new infrastructure tools uh, to slow vehicles down at intersections. I've also currently got a lot of involvement in ANRAM um, projects across the country. So please feel free to contact me if you have any inquiries about today or anything that we discuss. I'll also put my details up at the end if you need to get those details again. So just some housekeeping. Uh, today's webinar goes for 45 minutes approximately. We'll also be recording this session, so we'll email you a copy of the presentation and the, um, the recording at the very end. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions at any time because obviously this is the point of today's session. Um, you can ask questions by typing it into the questions box um, on your panel which can be found on the control panel and I will read these out and then one of our panel members can address it. And there's also um, a hands up tool so that's the picture on the right there. Um, so if you have any technical difficulties feel free to flag that and our IT staff will get straight onto it. So today's expert panellists, we have Paul Roberts in WA. Say hi, Paul. G'day. Yep, there we go. We've got Chris in Victoria. G'day. <laughs> and we've got David McTiernan in New South Wales. Hello, everybody. Great. So before we begin, does anyone have any questions? I'll, if you do put it up any questions, We'll address them pretty much straight away um, as soon as there's a break in the conversation. So just go for it. It doesn't even have to be on the topic. I mean, it has to be on speed management and speed limits. But beyond that, you can change the topic if you feel that you want to address something in particular. Um, so yeah, we'll get straight into it. This is the, the vague overview that we'll be following um, in today's webinar. But like I said, if you have something that you want to talk about in particular, just write it in the questions box and we'll start talking about it. So uh, firstly, we'll be talking about relevant guides, looking at state and jurisdiction supplements and what's also happening locally and internationally. Then we'll move on to the safe system and safer speeds. And lastly, we'll be looking at innovation and the need for it. So David, I believe that you're our relevant guides guru, so I will pass the floor on to you. Thanks, Kate. I'm not sure about guides guru, but I've certainly <laughs> um, in, the, in the last 12 months had a, a fair bit to do with um, reviewing some Austro's guides and um, working with some colleagues in the other offices, Chris in particular, on different Austro's projects. So um, hopefully I can uh, convey a few, uh, a bit of information to everyone about the guides which I think um, would provide everyone with uh, a, a good overview knowledge about speed limits and managing um, speeds on our roads. So I'd certainly recommend that um, practitioners in particular get out there and have a look at the, the Austroads guides and get familiar with the Australian standard. Um, be aware too though, and it's uh, in, in a couple of slides time, that uh, there's also your relevant jurisdiction will more than likely have their own guide or at least some uh, um, some supplements to the Austroads guides. So the three, the, the two main guides within Austroads um, relating to speed and speed management um, is the Austroads Guide to Road Safety, uh, in particular part three, um, which is titled Speed Limits and Speed Management. Um, the other one, and Austroads has done this in the last five years, they've tried to specialise their guides and have lots of cross references. Um, the other one is the Austroads Guide to Traffic Management part five. Um, in particular, Section 5, um, which is titled 
uh, road management and section 5 is about speed limits in particular. So the idea that Austroads has tried to do is, is talk about a, a topic and then touch on specific areas that, that, uh, that influence that topic. So if we look at um, part 3, um, it is about speed limits and speed management. So it's got a lot more information in it um, for the practitioner to have a look at. So it's got a general introduction um, as most Austroads guides do and it talks about speed um, speed management. It talks about it in the in the safe system context, and no doubt uh, everybody um, online today has, has no doubt heard about the safe system approach. Uh, interesting question might be, what does it really mean? And and when it comes to speed, what does it mean? Um, and Chris will be touching on that topic in, in a little bit more detail, so I won't go into it too much. The part three then talks about what a speed limit is. It'll outline. Um, the different types of speed limits that can be applied uh, and primarily that obviously is a numerical value but then where they should be applied and, uh, and how they can be reinforced through road infrastructure measures to assist. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier there will be cross references to perhaps a guide to road design, guide to traffic management to help get some more detail on that. Sorry, importantly, oh. importantly um, how to choose a speed limit. Uh, now, there's a number of people from local government online today uh, and in, in the main local government doesn't get to choose a speed limit, not one that's enforceable, but obviously you have a, a, an in, input to it through the road design, um, through your town planning processes. So it, it's still relevant that uh, local government practitioners understand how they should choose a speed limit when they're looking at designing a road environment. So that'll give you some factors to consider there. And there's a range of appendices um, in the guide which reference overseas practice, um, what the 85th percentile speed is, etc. So part five, um, the guide to traffic management, which is about road management, um, again, will have a general philosophy and practice. Uh, it again discusses the type of speed limits that are available, cross-referencing back to part three, um, the application of speed limits, some advisory tools, how, how you can advise people um, about the speed environment and that can be through signage but also through, also through the physical environment and how it's designed. Um, how they should be signed um, with signs and warning and um, uh, advisories of speed limits ahead. Some physical speed management devices which is uh, traditionally people might refer to that as local area traffic management or LATM. So it uh, gives you some advice there, but uh, in Paul's area we'll be talking about innovation, so there's some advances in that area as well. And again, some commentaries and appendices. The commentaries in particular um, make more detailed reference, usually to papers or other reports, um, or indeed guidance from specific jurisdictions. So it's Dave, definitely I'm worth having. Pause there. We've just had a question come through. Sure. Um, who determines the speed limits if it's not the local governments? Is it Vic Roads? Um, now, I'm from New South Wales, so I might need Chris to jump in, but in the main across Australia and New Zealand, it's uh, speed limits are set by the state um, or territory agency. Um, that could vary a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that, say, the city of Brisbane um, has a greater involvement in managing things such as traffic lights. So. Is that, uh, what, what's your understanding of that, Chris? It changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So in New South Wales, it's highly centralised and local government plays um, more of an advisory role. In, in Victoria, it's generally referred to local government to take an initi initiative in initiating um, speed limit change on the local road network. On okay. state network would be Vic Roads. Uh, in all jurisdictions, the final approval is with the state government, so yeah. um, it's just how it's managed is a little bit different and how centralised it is. Um, I think New South Wales is, is most centralised, um, um, WA is also fairly centralised, a small um, number of people who make that decision, South Australia is centralised, there's only I think one person who makes a, all the decisions, um, so it's um, it just varies, but local government should definitely take keen interest in setting speed limits. And certainly in New South Wales, local government has a role in, in reporting um, and representing their local community and through the local traffic committee structure they can certainly identify um, a desire to for a speed zone review. Um, but as Chris said, really that comes down to the roads and maritime services in the end. 
Hopefully that addresses that question. Um, let us know if there's any more you need. Um, the last main guide that we have in Australia, and uh, New Zealand has something similar, is the uh, Australian Standard, AS1742. Um, in particular, there's, there's two parts, part two, which is about traffic control devices, and part four, which is really about speed controls. So there's a, a fundamental difference between Austroads and, and Australian Standards. Um, Australian Standards in the main will be highly technical guides um, or requirements that, that establish you know, minimum lengths and that sort of thing. Um, Austro's guides generally are practitioner guidance and, and practice and best practice and things like that. Um, certainly don't have the same standing as an Australian standard document, but um, certainly uh, has, brings together the collective knowledge and practice um, across jurisdictions in Australia and New Zealand. Um, one of the things which I think is, is really important, and, and Chris might touch on this a little bit later, and, and perhaps Paul in innovation, is I think uh, when we talk about speed limits, we really need a strong speed limit hierarchy. Um, and that needs to support and be supported by the road function and the design. So that's one of the fundamentals, I think, really, when you talk about safe systems. So I won't touch more on that. Um, I'll leave that for Chris's section. Um, if we move on to the next slide, we're, what we've done there is just try to summarise um, briefly what local manuals there are. And, and again, practitioners need to be really aware of this. You can't just pick up Standards Australia or Austroads and start applying that without recognising that there are local guides and, and requirements. So um, certainly have a look on your local jurisdiction's website. Um, and if you, like in New South Wales, if you've got a, a traffic committee representative, if you're on local government, then certainly they can point you in the right direction. So there's a range of guides there. There was an Austroads project I was involved in late last year, which reviewed all the um, local manuals, Australian standards and the Austroads guides, and then looked internationally as well. Um, and there is a wide range of, of practice when you get down to the detail. Uh, in the main, I think uh, the philosophy is fairly similar, but um, certainly the, the devil's in the detail in some respects. And the length of speed limits can vary quite uh, a lot, or speed zones rather, can vary quite significantly from one jurisdiction to the other. Um, in, in some jurisdictions, speed limits, certain speed limits were, were being phased out, the 70s and 90k speed limits, for example. Um, and in others, they were being retained as, as valuable options when we're looking at re-limiting uh, re a road. Just um, the next slide there, Kate, is uh, just, just a diagrammatic of, or, of the covers of the, the, the local manuals and guidelines that we were able to find off the relevant websites. Um, the the Vic Roads uh, guide there was reviewed and published in 2013. And um, I think at that stage there was a a change in policy by the government and 70s and 90s speed limits were being phased out. That's that's now been changed with a change in government. The New South Wales speed zoning guidelines, um, they're about to be reviewed by the New South Wales Centre for Road Safety. Um, so that's almost a watch this space. Um, how that will change, it's a bit unclear, but um, I guess we'll have to wait and see. And then you have the, the Queensland guide, which follows very much the structure of the Australian standards. So if you're familiar with the Australian standards, you'll be quite familiar with part four speed controls. But um, uh, again, there, there'll be some Queensland specific issues there. Um, and South Australia has uh, different guides for uh, different types of speed limits. And the one shown is for 40K speed limit precincts. Um, so what's happening more locally? Um, there's been a few announcements that you may or may not have heard, depending if you're in the jurisdiction or, or keep an eye on this sort of thing. Uh, in the Northern Territory in particular, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, there's been quite a lot of discussion and a trial of what they've called um, de-restricted speed limit. Uh, and it's only been on a specific highway between Alice Springs and um, essentially Darwin or, or some sections of it. Um, the recent announcement, uh, I think probably about a month ago, was that uh, Northern Territory Agency had reviewed that trial. Um, they've identified, um, based on crash data analysis and some enforcement information, um, that they will extend that trial. They will adopt the deregulated speed limit um, along this particular highway. 
and um, Northern Territory seems to be pretty happy with that. Do you think that poses um, a safety risk to, say, um, tourists, for instance, who are not particularly used to um, open speed limits and also particularly long rural roads and huge distances between places? Do you think that might be um, an issue in future that they might come across? That, that's an interesting point, Kate, and it's, in some respects it's one of the reasons why um, certain advocates are pushing for de-restricted or higher speed limits. Mm. Um, in Australia, obviously, the tyranny of distance means that um, fatigue is a very real road safety issue, uh, yeah. and higher speed limits are, are one measure to try and reduce the time on the road. Um, I'm personally not, not opposed to higher speed limits, but if we look to the experience overseas, and that's, I think, in my next slide, um, it's about fitting the speed limit to the road environment um, that matches the function and, importantly, the safety criteria. The way Northern Territory has applied it, it's on an undivided rural road, lots of straight sections, sure, big wide open um, uh, environment and big clear zones, but it's still an undivided carriageway. Yeah. And if you look at how that's still applied undivided. overseas, yeah, that, that, that's, um, that really goes against everything that's being done overseas. There. Um, but just to continue what he was talking about, um, there is an issue with having divided roads uh, or having undivided roads that are particularly straight, I mean that can add to fatigue, it can, um, there's a lot of risk of rollover in those particular scenarios. Chris, did you yeah. have anything to add on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'm, look, I'm, uh, I'm back online, I don't know oh, if right, you can hear right. back. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Yeah, Sorry, Chris. Lost the sentence. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if I can throw in something about the review, I had a, a flick through it. It, it was basically uh, because of these are low volume roads, uh, the number of crashes are is very small. It was small, mm. always small after, and uh, to the point where it's not uh, the meaning. There was no meaningful uh, outcome from the from the review. They simply made an made an ob observation. There were no no more uh, crashes than before, and and called that a, a victory um, or a success. Um, but in fact, there was just no statistical uh, strength in the results, and the methodology was really basically quite um, simple, just looking before and after, and didn't take uh, in account, for example, uh, what else is happening in uh, along that road or in the whole territory, whether crashes are generally going up or generally going down, mm -hmm. or seasonal effects. So it was a very uh, tokenistic uh, review based on very little data, and uh, I think uh, my, my conclusion will be we, st we still just don't know um, what's happened. What's clear is there hasn't been a great disaster. You know, it hasn't sort of caused a, a, a mass increase in, uh, in, in crashes. Then you wouldn't expect it from a road that carries uh, a very, very few cars. Mm. Yep. We've just had another question come through. I think it's relating to the last slide. Um, there seem to be many supplement mm. guides. Uh, supplementary guides. Why haven't all the states adopted the Austro's guides so this can be streamlined across mm -hmm. Australia? That is a very good question, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a question for for any of us who have tried to prepare guides um, and harmonise the practice across Australia and New Zealand. Um, I mean, really, it comes down to um, different jurisdictions have different community expectations. They have different political imperatives and um, they have slightly different technical um, histories as well. So in the end, I think uh, Austroads is working hard. I think the jurisdictions are, are coming on board and, and trying to minimise the, the differences. They're recognising the value in harmonisation. Uh, and I think it's something that will happen over time. Whether we achieve 100% the same, I guess, is uh, it's a, another wait and see. Um, if I just touch on um, the rest, the, the last couple of slides, because I'm conscious the, the other two guys need to have a chat as well. Um, if you look at what's happening in, in, in Queensland and New South Wales, they're, they're two jurisdictions who have, have also put on the table, um, at least at a political level, the desire for increasing speed limits. Um, their approach differs quite significantly from the Northern Territory, and, and perhaps that's an example of, of a different um, perspectives in jurisdictions to suit local conditions. Um, Queensland, New South Wales um, has a, a reasonably extensive motorway network, um, high class, depending on how old some of those motorways are, high class design, um, divided carriageways, 
um, and a lot higher traffic volumes. Um, and so the approach in both those jurisdictions, again, announced politically, is that they would like an investigation of whether a higher speed limit is appropriate and where that would be appropriately applied. Uh, in New South Wales, uh, my home jurisdiction, the Minister certainly has issued an instruction to the Roads and Maritime Services to identify routes where a hundred up to speed limit up to 120 kilometres per hour can be applied and importantly what the cost would be to facilitate that speed limit being implemented. Um, and look that's one of the, the ticks I guess the Northern Territory Government deserves too. They didn't just go and whack on an unlimited speed limit on a, on a large long straight road. They did invest you know, tens of millions of dollars upgrading that road to accommodate the high speed limit. Um, I guess, it, again, it just comes back to whether, from a road safety perspective, we think that level of upgrade is adequate. And it's certainly something in New South Wales and Queensland, they've been perhaps more conservative, more um, um, keeping in, in touch with uh, current practice, particularly overseas. Um, internationally, if we go to the next slide, um, and just checking, this really is the last slide for me. Yeah, um, the it's highly variable, um, and whilst we've highlighted the US and the EU there, even within the EU, it's quite uh, a variable approach. But um, I think the European in, in Union, in particular, and, and all countries, member states within that, have quite a different perspective, and, and perhaps some of that's the history as well. So. Whilst they can have higher speed limited roads, um, again, it's, it's fit for purpose. So when you look at their residential environment um, or built up areas, they tend to have lower speed limits than we do here in Australia. Um, and then perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, um, you get higher speed limits. And two classic examples are the Netherlands and Germany. So the Netherlands on their divided motorways will have 130k speed limit um, applied and the roads are designed to, to cater for that. And obviously Germany and its autobahn is probably the, uh, the, 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 the gold, gold lined um, standard in terms of high speed limited roads. Um, it's, it's not all unlimited. Um, there are certainly speed limits applied on the autobahn. Um, and again, it's fit for purpose. They'll apply speed limits where the standard doesn't quite meet the requirement that they demand. So if there are highway interchanges, as they're passing near or through towns, um, those sorts of areas will have speed limits applied. And importantly, from a road design perspective, um, it's, it needs to be understood that they don't have a road design which is necessarily suitable for an unlimited speed for 200 kilometres per hour. They have a maximum design speed for their autobahn of 130 kilometres per hour. And I think the other thing about Europe, for example, is a different culture, a different perspective um, on things. So if you are a driver on the autobahn and you have a crash, it is incumbent on you to prove that you are driving safely. Um, it's a, it, they have a certain design speed limit and in the end they put the onus back on the motorist. Whereas I think um, typically in Australia, we're probably expecting the road will meet an unlimited road uh, speed limit. And therefore, if there was a crash, it would probably go back to the road authority. I think that's sort of the attitude, and that's one of the fundamental differences. Um, David, are you aware at all of how third world countries are dealing with their speed limits and who they're getting advice from? Um, it's funny, I, I was making a few notes about this slide, and I, I talked about the Middle you East. I just uh, lost him again. No, um, I can, can define yeah. a few things. We, yeah, we've sure. done some international reviews on this, and the, um, the practice is good. And there are jurisdictions, countries out there where speed limits don't exist. Um, there's quite a lot where speed limits have been introduced over the years and um, they're virtually meaningless. There is no enforcement, no, no effective enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the driving culture is, predates the speed limits and it's, it's pervasive. So people basically drive not so much to conditions, just as fast as they can possibly get away with. Um, there's huge speed differential, so a lot of places, even Southern Europe, Middle East, there is there is that. It's, they're not really speed limits are not um, something you can take very um, seriously. Um, and certainly, Chris. Also, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, certainly, Chris. I was just going to touch on the Middle East before um, I seem to have dropped off. Um, 
the, the Middle East is, is a cultural thing uh, and they are, whilst I wouldn't necessarily class them as a developing country, um, from a road safety perspective, they're certainly in, in a development phase and they, the authorities there are serious about um, enforcement and, and serious about speed limit and control, but culturally it is still a long way to go to have the population um, see the seriousness of, of inappropriate speeds for inappropriate conditions. Um, no doubt there'll be some more and I'm happy to come back to others, but um, perhaps you want to move on to Chris and, and Paul. Yeah, great. Thanks, David. Um, just a reminder to everyone, please keep your questions coming through. It's been really helpful. Actually, we've just had another question. Um, are autobahns something we are considering having here in Oz? Um, I, I don't... <laughs> I don't think we would be. I think the, the cost of that sort of thing would be prohibitive over the long distances that we have in Australia. But certainly with the New South Wales review, um, we, we helped the Centre for Road Safety look at what the design standards are overseas for these high speed limited roads. And the autobahn was something we uh, looked, in, looked at. So we've identified design criteria that our local motorways and highways would need to, to comply with if we were going to achieve the, the perspective, the safety of those roads in Europe. And um, that's the sort of thing RMS at the moment are looking at doing. Can can those our existing highways, even our new ones in, uh, up north in the Pacific Highway, can they meet these standards? Uh, and if not, what's required to bring them up to standard? So not, not autobahns, but perhaps something where we can increase the speed limit if appropriate. I, I, would, uh, I would sort of pose a question to well to, to really consider why why would an autobahn be considered a benchmark? Um, I mean they're not uniform for starters. The, a lot of them were built in 60s and 70s uh, with these open speed limits. Um, so there's been a lot of development in freeway design. Um, it's just that that's a tradition that they have in in Germany is, is of open speed limits and, and it's disappearing. We, we're feeling. Uh, inquiries from researchers in, and policymakers in Germany about uh, managing uh, what they have, which is sections with open speed limits and then sections with uh, speed limits, fielding um, questions about how to set speed limits because they haven't got much expertise at that because of you know, some, some legalistic kind of uh, issues that they set themselves up with. But, but going back to um, autobahns, it's it's not necessarily gold standard. I mean, there are no safety barriers designed for 130 kilometres an hour. They just don't exist. All of them are tested to uh, 100, I think in Europe maybe 110, uh, but they just simply, we, we don't know how they perform uh, when they're hit at 130k. And so there's, there's lots and lots of issues like that in, in design which would ha really have to be researched thoroughly and an answer before we can say, hey, yeah, well, look, we, we can have a freeway that operates safely at 130 kilometers an hour. So my perspective on decisions in Europe to increase speed limits on uh, on some of the new freeways is that it is a political decision. It's it's that's how those decisions have been made. Mm -hmm. There has been some technical review of them, of course, but it's been driven by. Uh, a broader transport perspective by perhaps um, you know quicker transport between different sides of the continent and um, not necessarily d by design yeah more about appealing to the community than mm. safety mm. and they've tried to, tried to uh, the as it is as it is here chris as it is here that it's it's a community and a political push for high speed limits in new south wales and at the very least i think we're looking at it technically can it be accommodated what needs to be done yeah and that's probably a good segue into your safe system discussion, actually. Well, I'm going to take things right down <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the numbers. Um, I, I don't know how many people have uh, heard or have had some training on, on safe system philosophy. Uh, I just wanted to, to introduce it. This is the, the paradigm that for the last few years, nearly 10 years, has been adopted at all at state and federal level in uh, dealing with with road safety. So our national road safety policy is driven by a safe system philosophy and also the state policies and many local government policies. So the paradigm, the safe system paradigm is essentially about saying we 
do not accept death and serious injury in road transport. Um, it's not about balancing mobility and safety or, or uh, you know, blaming it on the user. It's basically saying, as a vision, we say no. Um, and taking steps towards that vision. I'm not saying we're going to get there tomorrow, but it's taking the steps. And it changes the flavor of, of everything we do in road safety and also in speed management. So getting down, unpacking this a little bit, the safe system is basically constructed of four pillars that you see on, on the screen. And the two more engineering ones are the safe roads and roadsides and safe speeds. They are the things that sort of the, the transport engineers, traffic transport engineers can influence. Safe road users, that's a lot to do with access to the road system, so uh, licensing, also enforcement, you know, being sober, uh, not being fatigued, um, things like that, and safe vehicles, and of course that's, the, that's a huge area uh, where we're looking at improvements in uh, active and passive vehicle safety, and that's, that's developing uh, rampantly at the moment, and we're talking about uh, driverless vehicles and things like that, and CITS, and there's, there's a lot going on. All of these four pillars are interconnected, and they work together, and they have to work. That means different institutions have to work together to, to make it happen, to achieve the safe system. So focusing on safe speeds, I might move on to the next graph. Um, basically, some very old research that has been um, adopted in Australia and New Zealand and elsewhere in the world looked at the biomechanical um, strength of human bodies and, and proposed some relationships between fatality risk and impact speed. And this graph here shows that the key relationships that we have, uh, we've had those for oh, about 15 years or so, and basically they, they're saying that the risk of fatality is minimized if you have a, say, if you're a pedestrian and you hit at about uh, 30 kilometers an hour, um, your risk of fatality is fairly small. Um, and of course, you'd want, you wouldn't want to be hit at 30. You would like to be hit if you're going to be hit <laughs> yeah. at, at, less, at less than 30. Yeah. But importantly, if it's any more than 30, the risk increases dramatically, as you can see by the red line. Mm -hmm. Similar relationships exist for the side impact, which is about 50, and for the head-on, which is 70. So there's two vehicles uh, going at each other at 70k an hour. Uh, there's also some uh, some information there about roadside crashes, which is roughly about 40 kilometers an hour uh, if you hit a, a, like a pole object type of thing. So these, th this evidence has influenced how we approach safe system and safe system in relation to the speed. Now, that clearly creates a certain gap. If you're looking at the discussion we just had about autobahns and, and 130k speed limits and or unlimited roads, and you say, well, if I hit another car sideways, you know, a, a, like an intersection crash at 50k an hour, that's, we shouldn't happen at any faster than that. There's a big gap. So the practice in the last few years has been developing towards bridging these gaps and using various innovative techniques to, to try to well, bring the speeds down towards these ideal speeds. Uh, obviously, and this is a progression towards the vision, not vision in one leap. Uh, but also there are good examples of where we have already uh, reached that vision or many elements of it. So if you think about pedestrianized areas, um, such as before, <laughs> I didn't realize that our participants could hear our conversation before, but we're talking about George Street in Sydney. So about pe pedestrianization and taking the cars out of there or slowing them right down. So that creates this environment where um, you know, the vehicle pedestrian impact will almost certainly occur at less than 30 kilometers an hour. So that, that is a, a really strong wind for, for, for safe system. The, the idea is that if we uh, progress to this and, and innovate, we're going to get to the point where fatalities and serious injuries are minimized. So at the moment, the national strategy looks at um, a reduction by 30 percent uh, until 2020, and we're well on the way towards that. It's actually that the, the things implemented by road agencies, local and state, are actually working quite well. 
with the, the graph up on the screen, um, obviously you were saying that that's quite old now, like it's been around for a while. Yeah. Um, do you think that those numbers have improved at all or got any higher with vehicle technology? It's really interesting. Um, well, we're doing research at the moment uh, on this subject and it ba basically these, these are quite dated now, the cars have improved. There is quite a bit of um, new evidence suggesting that fatality risk, um, that the impact speed is actually higher for pedestrians. There's been a lot of modifications to the fronts of vehicles and some studies suggest as high as 50. But I, I want to point to the uh, to what we're talking about. It's a fatality risk. Yep. Safe system is about fatality and serious injury. So the set of stuff that's going to land you in the hospital. We're trying to prevent those. Mm -hmm. So we've been focusing on developing some revised uh, curves that deal with fatality and serious injury risk. And these, um, these numbers do actually go backwards uh, a fair bit. And there's still work being, uh, being done on this and uh, yeah. there'll be some time that's actually involved in broader community, uh, research community in this work. Um, going on to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, I think we covered those pretty well. These are the human tolerances um, as, as we currently uh, adopt in the policy work. Um, I, I think, um, I wonder if there's any questions about this before we move to some innovations around this thing. Um, well, I've, I've got a question. So how is the crash record of a road considered when you're assessing the speed limit? Hmm. Okay, well this is sort of getting into the, the technical nitty gritty. Um, it's done slightly differently in each jurisdiction. Um, we, we've run workshops on this in the past and happy to run them again. Uh, but each jurisdiction has a supplement uh, that you've seen there that tackles this a little bit differently. Some use software uh, to, to help you through the steps. but generally you'll be looking at the crash rate so casualty crashes per um, hundred million vehicles entering or, or 100, uh, 100 million vehicle kilometers so it's a, it's a sort of adjusted for exposure mm -hmm. it gives an idea what, how dangerous this road is and you're looking at an average rate for a given road and compare it to the mean for similar roads or the outline, sort of outlying bounds, the, the standard deviations around it. And if the road that you are assessing lies well, well above the, the average, then that is taking as a consideration factor in setting and recommending a lower speed limit. Mm. Uh, we've just had another question come through. Uh, what are your thoughts on timed speed limits? And as in on an arterial road that runs through a shopping precinct? Oh, yes. Well, that's, um, I think that's been uh, rolled out quite well in quite a few jurisdictions. Um, the time speed limits have been targeted to high pedestrianisation, but highly pedestrianised areas, so you know, strip shopping centres and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's really just going back to that safe system discussion. It's really trying to get the speed limit down and speeds down to that more closer to that survivable. Um, impact speed uh, when the pedestrians are there. So m most of them are targeting particularly the high activity hours of the day and they revert back to um, you know to higher speed limit to some sort of default. So the idea is that they're there for, for safety particularly for vulnerable road users, pedestrians, cyclists, etc. Um, and uh, there has been an evaluation of that is, which has been successful. Mm. Yeah. One of, one of the things I'll just add to that is um, time speed limits can be used for congestion management as well. Yes, um, true. It's the speed differential can cause um, can cause congestion problems, particularly on motorways and highways. And if you can get the the, the, the traffic travelling at pretty much the same speed, then you can push more vehicles through. So you, you'll see that sort of arrangement as well. And uh, going back to the safety issue, it's not all about the pedestrians. You, in, in New South Wales, we have our motorways with variable speed limits and they can be varied based on the driving conditions. So in adverse weather conditions, for example, where obviously you need more distance to slow down uh, and stop, 
then if you lower the speed limit, you can improve safety that way as well. So time speed limits or variable speed limits are definitely uh, one of the tools that uh, need to be more widely applied, but how they're applied is, is critical. You need people to yeah. know when the speed limit has changed. There are two different things. I think it's important yeah, to, to know that yeah, yeah. Time, time speed limits are by time of day, regular same, so school zones, for example. Yeah. Variable mm -hmm. speed li limits uh, can be uh, set by time or can be set by an algorithm in response to traffic conditions. Or crashes, okay. or if they yeah. need to shut down a, yes. a lane in a tunnel or something yep, yep, like yep. that. Yeah. Um, so I guess that, that's probably a good idea to move on to our last topic. So keep your questions coming through. They've been great so far, so great to hear your feedback. Um, Paul, would you like to talk about the need for innovation? Absolutely. Uh, hi, everybody. Hope you're still with us. You haven't nodded off yet. Um, I will try not to um, uh, uh, do anything that would uh, encourage you to nod off. Um, I just wanted to... I'll try not to spend too long going through this because it might be useful. This, this will in a way may suggest some things that um, link to some of the things that we've talked about already uh, and may lead to some discussion. Um, I wanted to just start off with this, um, as is my want, going back to fundamentals um, and just trying to think about why do people actually speed. Um, and I guess that there are, there are three general reasons. Um, I wouldn't want to... Um, uh, be held to this too much, but in general, I think that you can we can identify three things. The first one is error. Um, we know that we speed simply because um, we make an error at some point or other. Um, we either um, don't know what the speed limit is on a particular section of road, and that um, raises some interesting questions uh, about why that is um, and how we address that, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, or we simply are not paying attention um, to our speed limit. Um, the second kind of category of reasons why people speed is what I've called contingencies um, or consequences. And that is the really kind of obvious idea uh, that there's no reason not to speed uh, or that there's active encouragement to speed in some form or other. Um, there are consequences for not speeding. Uh, we might be late to something important uh, or um, there are... Um, uh, Traffic is such that uh, we don't want to get stuck behind uh, enormous trucks, for example, so we might want to speed to get past those. So they're both rewards for speeding and there's punishments that accrue if we don't speed. And I think we need to, 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 to think about those kind of things pretty carefully because the whole road system is set up in a way sometimes uh, that makes it desirable for us to speed. Um, and once we start thinking about that, I think we can think of some interesting ways that we might actually modify driver behaviour. Um, and the final category, which is not unrelated to the others, but is a, a more general kind of consideration, is about risk perception or risk compensation. Um, so we often speed because it looks like, uh, from just the look of the road and our understanding of the road, um, that it is in fact safe to speed. Uh, we know that people have a kind of internal baseline level of safety that they're comfortable with. Um, and that translates into uh, different kinds of behaviour um, that um, uh, hold people around that kind of baseline level uh, of comfort in their safety. Um, so quite often we find in a number of areas, and this has been looked at quite a lot in, in a road safety context, uh, is we find risk compensation behaviour. So for example, if we put something in the road environment that makes it look riskier, irrespective of whether it's objectively more risky or not, um, so long as people's assessment is that that makes a more risky road environment, people will will compensate for that, often by slowing down or by driving in uh, a more careful manner. Um, it's a little bit hard to guarantee exactly how people are going to respond uh, when they um, do this kind of risk compensation, but speed is a very, very common way of responding to a perception uh, of increased risk. So we're going to, if we just go over to the next slide, just wanted to talk through uh, some of the ways, based on those three categories of reasons why uh, people speed, um, talk through some ways in which we might actually address those different 
reasons why people speed. Once we start thinking like this, I've just got a, a, a few things uh, under each category, but once we start thinking like this, I think that we really can come up with some very, very innovative ways uh, of reducing uh, or controlling speed, managing speed uh, in an appropriate way. And I think um, we talk about the safe system approach. One of the, the things that we really want to do in the safe system approach is not just, uh, and I think Chris alluded to this, we don't just want to put in uh, speed limit signs everywhere that correspond to the, um, the safe speeds in particular kinds of road environments. We actually want people to want to drive at the right speed for those kind of road environments. So the question becomes, how do we actually do that? If we look at um, simple error behaviour, um, there are a number of ways in which uh, we can control for speed error. One of those would be uh, intelligent speed adaptation systems, and they've been trialled um, in a number of places. Intelligent speed ad adaptation is really just a black box that goes in a vehicle. Um, that and then there's a number of versions of it. Um, it might just simply warn a driver uh, that they're speeding uh, by reference to a speed map um, that's um, uh, stored in the device um, with, uh, on the basis of uh, GPS coordinates, uh, or it might actually exert some control on the vehicle. Uh, in the most extreme case, you might have a kind of intelligent speed adaptation that prevents the vehicle going above uh, the posted speed limit in a particular area, or actively slows a vehicle down. Um, and that, those have been trialled in a number of areas, and um, there is evidence that they can be quite successful. The, I've also got IVMS there, which is uh, the kind of in-vehicle monitoring systems that we often see in uh, fleet vehicles or uh, in, on mine sites. Um, similar kind of um, approach, although they're usually not don't actively change uh, speed, but they do log uh, violations, if you like, or well, some problems with that, because we know that simply um, uh, logging violations and punishing people for doing the wrong thing uh, is not a really great way uh, of modifying behaviour. It's much better to modify behaviour in a positive way so that people actually want to, or uh, more or less unconsciously, um, uh, follow the appropriate speeds in a particular environment. I guess another way of uh, controlling for error which um, has been talked about a lot recently is autonomous vehicles and we're seeing them coming. There's going to be a, 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 a trial in Adelaide uh, later in this year of autonomous vehicles so it's not, it's not science fiction, it's really happening and furthermore it's really happening in Australia. Um, I guess from a speed perspective, there's huge potential for autonomous vehicles. A lot's been uh, talked about uh, the safety benefits of autonomous vehicles, um, but not a lot has been said about the, the sort of potential for, for clever speed choice of autonomous vehicles. You imagine that you start to get penetration of autonomous vehicles into the, into the fleet, um, and autonomous vehicles can choose an appropriate speed based on conditions, um, including the presence of other vehicles, weather, uh, roadworks. Um, they can then control the, the, the speed of the whole, um, the whole traffic system if there's enough of them floating around in that system. Um, and they can uh, match this speed appropriately so that we don't get speed differentials. Huge potential there for a relatively small proportion of autonomous vehicles to have a major impact uh, on the safety of the whole traffic system over and above the safety that accrues to an individual autonomous vehicle. I don't think that's really been talked about a lot um, or, or modelled for sure. I guess the, the other one that I just wanted to quickly mention, because I'll, I'll say something about that as a bit of a case study if we have time, um, is vehicle activated signs. So vehicle activated signs of the kind that I'm talking about, um, detect the speed of an approaching vehicle uh, and simply warn the vehicle if it's travelling too fast, uh, given the posted speed limit in that area, or entering a curve uh, too fast, um, etc. Um, so that's another way of controlling for error. The contingencies uh, heading that I've got there includes both, I've included both enforcement and rewards. We all know what enforcement is. As I've said, um, enforcement's actually not a great way of 
controlling speed behaviour for a whole variety of reasons, which I'm sure um, you can uh, appreciate. Um, it's not something that acts continuously, um, although it depends how you, you actually do that. Um, and we know from fundamental psychological research that punishment, which is essentially what enforcement is, is actually a bad way of shaping behaviour. Uh, has all sorts of um, negative side effects. Um, it's not particularly powerful and it's not particularly reliable. Um, but nevertheless, of course, um, it does have its place. Um, but I think we need to investigate the flip side of the coin uh, with respect to controlling um, contingencies and that's the reward side of things. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that you might think about um, under that kind of heading. Uh, people have talked about these sort of things for a long time but some of them are actually coming to fruition now. Um, one of those is, um, and I've just got insurance there, um, and what I'm talking about there is the, the kind of black box insurance schemes. And these have been popular in, particularly in the UK uh, for quite a while. Uh, where you get a box installed in your vehicle um, and that monitors your driving uh, behaviour, monitors things like speed, braking, um, g-forces and it essentially uh, there's uh, algorithm, uh, algorithms that different companies use but essentially assigns you some kind of a safety index if you like um, based on um, recording all that information about your driving behaviour uh, and may reduce your insurance premium based on um, its analysis of your driving behaviour. Now we know that uh, people that take up these insurance schemes uh, definitely have a lower crash rate uh, but of course the problem with that is that uh, it may well be a selection bias and it may well be that people that are safer drivers um, choose, in fact almost certainly the case that people that are safer drivers choose these kind of insurance schemes. Um, there is some research being done on this in Australia at the moment, um, which uh, hopefully will uh, allow us to disentangle those kind of selection biases and try and decide whether in fact you can modify people's behaviour uh, uh, towards more safe driving using these kind of insurance schemes. The second example that I had there under rewards is intelligent infrastructure. And really, one of the, the most interesting uh, examples of that um, is illustrated in that uh, picture on, the, on this page, which says speed sensitive signal. Uh, and that is to um, uh, have a radar that uh, detects the, the speed of a vehicle as it approaches a signalised intersection. If it's going at the appropriate speed, um, depending on other factors, uh, the signals will stay green or change to green. Uh, if the vehicle's speeding, uh, the signal will change to red. So a huge reward there for actually going through the in intersection uh, at the correct speed. And those have been rolled out in a number of uh, places in North America. I'm not sure so much about Europe. Um, but you can imagine um, uh, environments where they could be quite useful in Australia. Uh, and then I'm just mindful of time here, so um, I'll just yeah, quickly Paul, go we might need this. To, to wrap this wrap this up now. Um, I, I, I will. Anything? I'll just quickly talk about the risk perception, um, and yeah, we'll sure. drop the the case studies. So, sure. um, I I guess the 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 one that probably a number of people in Australia will be familiar with is lane narrowing. We know that simply um, uh, uh, painting the edge lines um, to produce a, a the impression uh, of a narrower lane um, reduces speed. That on its own reduces speed, and that's a risk perception uh, phenomenon. Um, people associate narrower lanes uh, with um, higher risk. You need more vehicle control uh, to track appropriate in the lane, and that gives you the sense that uh, it's more risky, and so you slow down. Vehicle activated signs, I mentioned already, um, they can be used to uh, indicate um, the risk associated with um, driving at a particular speed or entering a corner too fast, for example. Um, and then the final thing that I think is uh, quite important is this, these two categories of self-explaining roads and naked streets where uh, you actually, uh, you, within a whole local area, change the environment um, in such a way that it actually gives the, uh, the driver or it puts a, a huge amount of, um, uh, of the onus back on the driver to decide what is safe and appropriate 
Um, and the environment telegraphs that uh, in many ways uh, so that the driver drives in an appropriate way um, for um, uh, the particular environment. That picture at the bottom there is a, um, a city centre in um, the Netherlands. Um, uh, and basically that's got no road markings, no signals, uh, no signage whatsoever. Uh, but it results in people driving very carefully, um, keeping an eye out for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and that's a, a good example of naked streets. I should just say when I was looking for that picture and I googled naked streets, just be careful if you do that at work because you'll end up with um, something that you may not have been looking for. Um, oh, good. So, uh, yes. And on, on, on that note, um, I'll finish and maybe we can have a couple of questions if we've got time. Yeah, fantastic. So um, if anyone has any last minute questions, um, I'll just keep talking, but feel free to uh, pop them up and we'll answer them if we have any time. So just to say thanks to our, our three panellists for today. Um, I think it's been very informative. I hope it's been really useful for everyone else. If you have any questions about today, you can contact one of our panellists or you can contact myself. Um, there's my details. And also, um, if you have any comments about the Ask our webinar series in general, feel free to contact me and I can pass on the questions uh, appropriately. So thanks again for joining us today. We'd love to hear your feedback via the, sh the survey that will be launching shortly. And we hope that you'll join us again for future webinars. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for putting it all together. Thank you, Kate. Thanks a lot.